continuing on this morning uh, with our series called Random Acts of Christmas. And it's kind of a play on words off of random acts of kindness. And uh, we decided to, to kind of go through this series talking about generosity and, and how we can be generous in different ways. And um, one of the things that, one of the reasons that we're talking about generosity this season is because um, tis the season for generosity in general. There's something about the Christmas season that seems to draw out of us um, a willingness to help. Maybe uh, during this season we have a a little bit more awareness of the needs around us, but there's something about Christmas that does that. Uh, For instance, there's a website called uh, Google Trends where essentially you can type in a word, whatever word you want, and it'll show you uh, how often and when it's searched for. So here we have a scale on the bottom. It's hard to read, but basically on the far left is 2012 to 2016, and so it's a five-year span there, or 11 rather. And here you have, um, every time you see kind of a high point is right around the time of the right around Thanksgiving time and then early December, right? And if you were to to type in the phrase there, you know, charity or homeless or donations, you would see a very similar trend. And again, this isn't like a scientific study or a trend, it's just simply what people are searching for at a specific time. And you'll notice that every time at those high peaks is right around Thanksgiving, right around the Christmas season. For whatever reason, this is the season where people are a little more open to the idea of helping others. And it's not just uh, helping in, in practical, real, personal, face-to-face uh, methods either. People are more, more involved online with helping others than ever before. You know, it's the reason that we had a huge viral movement called Coney 2012 back uh, four years ago. It was the reason that in 2014 there was the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. You guys remember that? A lot of fun. People dumping cold buckets of head on their water, uh, or uh, water on their head, rather. I don't know how that would work. Um, But at youth group, we had like a big old kiddie pool. We dumped water and just filled it with ice, and we did like a slip and slide, just one after the other because we got challenged, and then we donated uh, the money. Um, We took a donation and gave it, actually, to a family locally who uh, was a caregiver for someone with ALS. And so um, there's all sorts of trends. You know, these days, there's all sorts of hashtags on Facebook and the internet go around. Hashtag, you know, no D-A-P-L, for instance. And all of these things um, show us that people are wanting to get involved more and more um, in different different ways, good or bad, whatever it may be. And in fact, because of this, there's even a phrase that's be, basically been invented called uh, slacktivism. Slacktivism. I don't know if you've ever heard of this term, but it's basically activism for slackers is kind of where it came from. It's basically um, when anytime you, you take internet action for a cause or something without actually doing a whole lot. And I'm not saying it's good or it's bad, it's just we are seeing a trend in giving, and especially during this time of of the Christmas season, people wanting to help. And today, um, I want to talk about and and kind of pose the question a little bit and and discuss it um, in our our week of, of, of random acts of Christmas. I want to talk about the question of what if our helping What if all of our our giving and our good deeds, what if uh, what we're doing here, what do we do when our helping actually is hurting? What do we do when our helping hurts? Or at the very least, what do we do when our helping isn't helping in the the way we might have thought it would, or or our helping isn't exactly doing what we hoped it would? The, the principle, it's actually an Eastern parable, um, and it, it tells a very clear, clear message, right? The monkey sees this fish struggling um, in, its, in its habitat and knows, you know, it can't survive in the water, so it does what it knows how to do. It helps the fish, of course, by taking it up, bringing it up into the tree where the monkey resides and where it's safe from the water. And at first, uh, the fish is really excited to be out of the water and so happy and grateful, and then, you know, finally the fish settles down a little bit, okay? It dies, then. That's, that's the one I'm trying to say. It dies. Um, but the message is pretty clear. Sometimes our helping is actually hurting a little bit. Now, um, today's subject, the, the idea of helping, is such a, um, such a broad concept and can apply to so many different things. And there's no way we're going to be able to talk about all the intricacies and all the various situations. But, um, for instance, you know, helping can be a friend uh, helping another friend. Helping can be a, a parent trying to help a child with something. 
Maybe it's a husband trying to help a wife, or maybe a little bit more serious, maybe it's um, you trying to help someone in your life who is in a bad cycle of, of behavior, maybe even addiction. Um, broaden that out a little bit more. Maybe um, helping can involve helping the poor and local poverty. Expand that out a little bit further as global poverty. There's so many different areas. And today I want to mostly kind of focus in on, on the interpersonal side of helping, the interpersonal element of, of helping. And um, it was funny because as I was, I was preparing for this message and I was thinking and, and gathering thoughts and things like that, um, Susan was sitting next to me, my wife, and um, I casually asked her, I was like, hey, give me an example of when, when helping hurts. You know, I'm thinking about global poverty and I'm thinking about how do we, you know, missions, trips, and solutions and that. I'm like, give me an example just to see what she, she was thinking of. And um, she gave the example. She's like, well, you know, you know when, you know, maybe the wife has had, had a bad day and maybe she wants to come home and, and talk about it a little while. And, and you know how um, the husband sometimes gives advice when really the wife just wants you to listen? <laughs> Ooh, and I'm like, yeah? What are you trying to say, Susan? You know? <laughs> and, uh, and she wasn't, she didn't mean anything by it. She just happened to say it. Maybe it was a Freudian slip or something. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, it was a great example. It's like, hey. That's a perfect example of when helping can sometimes hurt. And so we're going to focus on that interpersonal uh, dynamic today. Now, I want to start off by uh, talking about the the biblical concept of helping somebody else. It's all through the Bible. Um, We need to be helping people out. That's very, very clear. Um, And I want to draw, if we may, a a few principles from a story. And this is probably the most famous story of all time of somebody helping somebody else out. And it's uh, definitely one of the more famous ones. It's called the, uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan. You heard of it? The Good Samaritan. And it goes a little bit something like this. Basically, people are asking Jesus around him. They're saying, who is my neighbor? And Jesus in his story gives a response to which they were totally not expecting. Um, the neighbor actually ended up being something or someone that was completely different than who they had in mind. It goes like this, Luke 10. You can follow along on the side screens here. It says, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when they saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw, passed on by the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, He took pity on him. He went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Most famous probably parable uh, of all time, perhaps, who knows. And in it, we learn a couple things about helping other people. And I want to draw a couple principles. Again, this would have been a shock to the people listening. They're saying, what, Samaritan? The Samaritans would have, but that's my neighbor. And a little bit of context, you know, that, that road, Jerusalem to Jericho, was a very uh, tough and treacherous road to travel, very dangerous. And the first principle, um, as we're looking into biblical helping, that I want to draw from not only this, but just biblical principles in general is this, is that biblical helping makes a difference. Biblical helping makes an actual difference. In our story, uh, the difference was that a man's life was actually saved, right? Huge effect, huge difference. And one of the important things to remember with this is is being able to, in our helping, measure effectiveness appropriately. Being able to say, you know, when we give our money to some place, having a clear understanding of how that money is being used. Having an understanding of what it is actually going for. Same when we give our time or give our talent, whatever it may be. What is it that my helping is actually accomplishing? And thinking a little bit critically, are we able to measure our effectiveness? Is it actually making a difference? Because we are to be good stewards of God's stuff. Another thing uh, to think about is that a lot of times when we're thinking about people who are, are down and out or people who need help, there's kind of two schools of thought. The one school of thought looks at that person 
and says, you know what, they need to take personal responsibility and they need to they change and fix themselves. They, uh, they're not doing things right. They need, if only they would start doing things that are right, they'd fix their situation and everything would be fine. That's one school of thought, right? And then there's kind of another school of thought over here that says, actually, it's, it's the broader system at large that's keeping this person down or that's causing their problem in the first place. We need to fix the system as a whole in order to change that person's behavior. So on the one hand, it's the system, and on the other hand, it's the person itself. You with me so far? And in reality, I, I don't think it's an either or. I think biblically, biblically it's a both and an and. You see, Jesus was a person who came onto the scene and he challenged both people individually, but he also challenged systems, right? You see, Jesus came to the Pharisees and said, you whitewash tombs. You guys need to fix some stuff. You're not doing it right. But then he also, on the other hand, said, you know, you've heard it said this way, but I tell you, it's actually more like this. You've been following the old law this way, but really I came to fulfill the law and completely change the system on the whole. Jesus challenged both people and he challenged systems. It's not either or, it's a both and it's an and. If we're gonna really make a difference and we're really gonna challenge effectiveness in our helping, it's both systems, it's both people. Number two, biblical helping looks at the big picture. I believe that God, um, when he sent Jesus and Jesus came down, I believe that he had a purpose in mind and a vision for what people could be and a vision for what earth could be like. He called it the kingdom, introducing this concept of kingdom. And it, and it boils down to, in a lot of ways, one word, and that word is reconciliation. Reconciling people and creation and systems back to himself. In Colossians 1, 19 through 20, it says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. See, Jesus, when he came to earth and introduced this concept of the godly kingdom, like we sang in that song, heaven and earth colliding, he was coming and he's saying, I've come to reconcile this whole thing back to myself. Everything that's broken, I've come to actually make right. Everything that's old, I've come to make new. See, Jesus is reconciling creation back to himself. He's reconciling people's hearts back to himself, back to God. Reconciliation is the big picture in God's kingdom. Another part of uh, a biblical helping and looking at the big picture is, is being in it for the long haul, right? A lot of times, um, you know, we, we think of helping and we kind of give a little dose of helping there, a little dose of helping here, and we, we call it good when really uh, the solution is not temporary, that sometimes the solution involves going through and being a part of the process in the long haul. I'm not saying anything against spontaneous helping. Of course, there's a place for that but being in it for the long haul. Give me, give me an example. You, know, you go to the doctor's office, and one of the first things they give you when you arrive is a, is a big old sheet, and you write down your medical history, right? And you write down all the problems you've had. You write down surgeries. You write down illnesses, um, allergies, and things like that. And then the doctor asks you about them. And they ask you a little bit, uh, you know, what's, tell me a little bit about this. Tell me about that. He doesn't just make an assessment, you know, on the spot just by looking at you. He gets a little bit of history, right? And then, um, so oftentimes, you know, the doctor, maybe right then and there that day, will actually do something to fix your immediate need. Maybe it a, a surgery that needs to take place. Maybe you're in pain and he prescribes, you know, pain medication. Maybe, um, for instance, your blood sugar or your blood pressure, rather, and maybe your cholesterol is way up. Maybe he prescribes a, a, a medicine to help that down, but then he doesn't just stop there. The doctor also prescribes a long-term solution as well, Right? Maybe he prescribes the blood pressure medicine, but then he also says, you know what, but I'm also going to need you to start the habit of diet and exercise. This is why I don't go to the doctor, okay? Um, no, just kidding. Um, and the, the, the reality is that we need both the immediate fix, but we also need the long haul. We need to, the long-term solution as well. Jesus Christ um, was the perfecter of this, right? Uh, take, for example, the woman caught in adultery perilous situation. She's about to be killed, about to be stoned. 
And Jesus says, you know, he fixes the immediate problem and he says, let him who's, who's sinned first cast the first stone, right? But he doesn't stop there. He fixes the solution and then he turns to the woman and says, now go and sin no more. You see, Jesus knew that if he fixed the temporary solution but didn't fix the long-term problem, this woman would be right back in this situation. Jesus in his infinite wisdom knew that sometimes we need to keep the big picture of reconciliation in mind and sometimes we need to walk with the long haul. We need to walk with the long-term solutions. Number three, biblical helping is, is selfless. We've talked about how generosity is a giving of your time, your talent, and your treasure. It's easy to remember. And the Samaritan in this story gave all three. He gave his time not only to stop and put the man on his own donkey, but to come back later. He gave his treasure in that he paid the innkeeper and paid to have his moons, well, essentially paid the guy's hospital bills. And then he gave his talent he bandaged the wound and gave the remedy of the time of oil and wine at the time. He gave his time, talent, and his treasure. And he didn't do it for selfish gain. I mean, what did he have to gain? A Samaritan. Instead, he did it out of a selfless perspective. And biblical helping must come from a selfless perspective. If we're in it for personal gain, if we're in it for something that we get out of it, we're doing it wrong. So those are three things, um, three principles. Again, we could talk all day about that. But what about when helping hurts? Let's talk about that for a little bit. Um, there's a story I, I've told multiple times to my students in youth group, and every time I tell it, they just laugh and laugh and make fun of me. And that's fine. That's good. Uh, it's warranted. And basically, the story goes like this. Um, I was uh, fresh, uh, fresh at Radiant, pretty much. Uh, I was in youth group, and it was a Wednesday afternoon, which means I'm finalizing my message. I'm getting things ready to go. And that night, I remember I was talking about serving and helping the poor, uh, being there for the least of these, the homeless, the, the, you name it. And so as I'm driving to lunch with this message in mind, and I'm pondering and praying about it, um, I'm driving through the residential area, and over there at the park, I see that there is a homeless man. And he has a beard, kind of looks like this, big beard, uh, big coat, scruffy looking, just kind of, you can kind of tell it's just kind of down and out. And so I'm driving, and I see this, and I'm like, ugh, right? Time to practice what I preach, right? Oh, okay, I... I, I got to stop. I got to do something, right? I can't just be preaching about this to the kids and I and not do anything with the situation. And so finally I pull over and I, I get out of my car and, I, you know, the guy's kind of eyeing me from a distance. And I look at him like, hey, hey man, um, hey, I, I don't know your situation or anything and I, I don't know uh, what you're going through, but I, I saw you out here as I was driving by. Hey, is there, is there any way I could, I, I could buy you some lunch today? Can, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to drive you. I'm going to lunch right now. Is there any way I could buy your lunch. I figured he's homeless and, uh, you know, hungry, and I thought I could do some small thing to, to help him out. And he, and he kind of looks at me, and, you know, kind of wondering, uh, just kind of this inquisitive uh, gaze, and he, and he finally asks the question. He says, he says well, why? And, um, and so I, I was like, well, you know, I, I saw you out here, and again, I don't know your situation, man, but, I, you know, I figured, you know, maybe you're homeless, and I'm, I, I, I would love to, I don't know if you have a lot to eat. I, I'd just love to buy you lunch if, if I could, man. And I'll never forget what he said to me. And he looked at me, and I could tell this was uh, resonating in his mind. He looked at me and, and finally paused, and, and he said, dude, I'm not homeless. <laughs> I'm not homeless. I'm like, you're not homeless, right? What, are you, what am I doing all this for? Are you, are you kidding me? And I just remember, I just like, whoo like right, right back in my car like okay see you guys. god bless you right on my way and oh i was so embarrassed my face turned bright red oh it was so humiliating and i can only imagine what this guy who probably was thinking of me like who is this crazy man coming to offer and buy me lunch and there's a couple things that hurt first thing it hurt was my pride right it was terrible and i felt oh i was like oh this is terrible but who knows i i hope I didn't hurt this man's feeling, but I basically called some cool hipster dude a homeless man, right? And I just couldn't believe it, and it was so embarrassing. And of course, I, that night at youth group, I, I told the story, and they just, oh man, they lost it. They thought it was the funniest. They were like, you did what? Right? It's an example of when helping potentially could have hurt pretty bad. But what do you do? What do you do with the 18-year-old the nephew? You know, he... He works occasionally, but, you know, never saved a dime in his life. 
um, and he comes to you and he, he wants you to, to co-sign on a loan for a car, right? What do you do? What do you do with the classmate or the coworker who, you know, they want, want to borrow your car for a few days, right? While well, theirs is in the shop, but it's the third time they've asked this month. What do you do with the child who begs and pleads and says, Mom, please, you got to call in sick for me. There's a test I didn't study for, and, and you, don't, you don't want me to get a bad grade, do you? Come on, just call in sick. I can take the test later. That way I get a good grade. What do you do? What do you do with the coworker who asks you to cover for him for the second time this week? What do you do? Well, there's a story um, about Jesus, and uh, a rich young ruler comes to him. And this man has questions, and this man wants to know, you know, what do I, what do I got to do to get into the kingdom of heaven? What do I got to do to have eternal salvation? And Jesus is, is talking with this man, and, um, and Jesus says, well, you know the law, you know the rules, um, you know, honor your father and mother, don't covet, you know, don't steal, don't murder, all that. You doing that? And the guy's like, yeah, I'm doing all of it. I'm good to go, right? I've been obeying the laws. I've been doing it since I was a kid. Good? And Jesus takes it a step further. Mark um, 10, 21 says this. Jesus looked at him and loved him. And that's key. And he says, one thing you lack. Go and sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. This next part is heartbreaking. It says, at this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Guy comes expecting, you know, an easy answer. And Jesus essentially says, hey, here's what you got to do. Take it or leave it. And it says the man's face fell and he, he went away sad. We never hear from this guy again. And what's fascinating is that Jesus doesn't run after him. Right? Jesus lays it out. He says, hey, here's the solution. You got to take it or leave it. You know, it, it wasn't like the man, you know, his face sad and Jesus sees it and he starts to walk away and Jesus says, wait, 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 okay. I'll, okay, I'll make you a deal. Sell half of the stuff that you own and then we'll call it good. Jesus doesn't bargain. He doesn't, he doesn't make, you know, a temporary solution. Jesus knows there's, this is it. This is the way. This is the path. And he lets the man Go. Now that's interesting. I think it's because Jesus understood in his infinite wisdom, understood Proverbs 19:19, 19, 19, which says this. Take a look on the screens. It says, A hot-tempered person must pay the penalty. Rescue them, and you will have to do it again. You see, a hot-tempered person has a behavior that needs to change, right? That's not going to work for him to be a hot-tempered person. Maybe it's a person who, you know, that that kid who just gets angry all the time, gets in fistfights at school, or a co-worker who has, you know, anger management problems, whatever it is. A hot-tempered person must pay the penalty. And then it says, if you choose to rescue them from that penalty, if you choose to to help them out of of, of going through that natural consequence, you're going to have to do it again and again and again and again. You see, the principle is pretty clear. Actions have consequences. And if you simply remove the consequences from someone's bad behavior, well, the reality is you're not helping them at all. You see, when we rescue people from their consequences, what we're actually doing is we're rendering them powerless to change themselves. We're taking away their ability to see and learn and grow with God's help. You see, there's a word for this in psychology. It's called enabling. Enabling. And enabling, a, a simple definition, this is no, you know, not a, a comprehensive or exhaustive definition by any means, but it says essentially doing things for someone else that they can and should be doing for themselves. Compare that to the definition of helping, which could be doing things for someone else that they are not capable of doing for themselves. You see, when we choose to enable, we are offering actually the the wrong kind of help, right? Enabling creates powerlessness. Enabling is is discouraging to people. And actually, it's demotivating. 
If we're continuing to step in and continuing to bear the brunt of, of um, you know, that spouse who, you know, had another long night with drinking and we call in, uh, call in work sick for them the next day and make up a bunch of excuses, we're not helping anybody out. Our helping in that case is actually hurting. Anytime we remove natural consequences from people and we remove the ability to learn lessons and people to wake up and make changes themselves, we're enabling and our helping is actually hurting. Our helping with other people should be supportive, but not controlling. Make sense? Our helping with other people needs to be strengthening, not debilitating. Our helping needs to be mobilizing, not paralyzing. It's the difference between helping and enabling. So there's three questions I think that can at least get us down and get our feet started uh, on this road of, of, of helping that is biblical versus helping that is hurting. And the first question is this, are healthy boundaries in place? Are healthy boundaries in place in my own life? There um, comes a time when the people that you are maybe, you know, inter, interpersonal relationships with people you love and they're in behaviors that need change. And there are times when you need to make sure that you have the proper boundaries in, in place so they don't drag you down as well. And this is hard, right? It's hard to look at a loved one and say, actually, we're going we're gonna to stop this whole process that we've been doing. We're actually going to talk to each other a little bit more lovingly. We're actually not going to go down this road anymore. Henry Cloud, a famous Christian psychologist, he puts it this way. He says, but when you are dealing with someone who is hurting, remember that your boundaries are both necessary for you and helpful for them. If you have been enabling them to be irresponsible, your limit setting may nudge them towards responsibility. Does that make sense? And this is not easy. In fact, they might resent you for it. Because anytime you're filling that hole where uh, irresponsibility is lingering, where you're filling that hole where they should be doing something and should be doing something for themselves, and you set up boundaries to prevent that, there may be animosity there. Who knows? Boundaries can be hurtful, but they're necessary. And the reality is boundaries are necessary because comfortable people have no motivation to change. Does that make sense? Comfortable people don't have any motivation to change at all. I mean, why would they? For instance, um, I showed you that, that Google Trends uh, website. If you type in the word diet into Google Trends, uh, guess when the spikes happen on that graph? Any guesses on what month? January, January right? Guess when the absolute all-time low is? Any guesses? Christmas time. Yeah, Christmas, no. Uh, so Christmas is really low, and then it's like a heart rate monitor. It just spikes up in January, and then it's like, trickles down. Spikes up, trickles down. It's hilarious, actually. And it's so true, right? And it tells us a little bit something about human nature, and the reality is that comfortable people don't change, right? They don't. Cloud, again, says this. He says, when we change our behavior, when the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of changing, consequences Give us that pain that motivates us to change. I love that quote, right? And we see it all the time, right? When the pain of, the, of, 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 of dieting, right, becomes less than the pain of staying the same, that's when change happens because a comfortable person has no motivation to change at all. Henry Cloud understands Hebrews 12, 11 that says no discipline. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful, Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it, for those who have gone through the consequence, who have not been enabled, who have suffered a little bit, then God can work and he can move and he can fix a life. You know, the reality of this, this idea of setting boundaries and, and being willing to say no is essentially allowing us to step back and allow God to move in many ways. It's saying, you know what, I'm not going to be the person to fix. I'm not going to be the person to change this situation. It has to be God, so I'm going to set boundaries. I'm going to take a step back, and I'm going to allow God to do what he and only he is capable of doing. Where in your life might you need to say no to someone? 
What relationship might there be out there where there might be, need to be boundaries set up and in place? The second question I, I want to ask, the first one was, are healthy boundaries in place with my, help, my helping? The second one is, do I have the big picture in mind in my helping? The big picture, again, was this idea of reconciliation, of kingdom happening. I remember there was, um, there was a project that our young adults wanted to do. We wanted to paint one of our friend's uh, mom's houses. It was kind of in disrepair. And so uh, first thing was easy. We collected some money, got plenty of money, no problem. Then we set a date to go over there uh, one time and kind of knock it out. And uh, no problem getting people. Everyone was jazzed up. It's like, yeah, let's paint this house. Woo! And then uh, by the end of the day, after a long hour, we realized we got halfway done, right? <laughs> That's how projects go a lot of times. And um, we kind of walked away. We're like, yeah, we did it, right? We kind of looked back at the house. And we're like, that's half painted, right? And we kind of like, ooh, right? And the second time, we kind of finally realized, like, we need to go back and actually finish this thing. We need to be in it for the long haul. But I want to tell you something. It was so much harder to find and plan that second time to go back and finish the work. Because at first, people are jazzed up. Let's go, let's do it. Let's raise money. Let's go out this one time, right? But when it requires additional effort, when it requires walking through the process, when it requires going down the long haul, it's easy to lose motivation. Do we have the big picture in mind? See, the good Samaritan was in it for the long haul. He said, I'm going to come back and make sure this situation is right. The good Samaritan didn't just like throw a Band-Aid and say, good luck to you, right? He was in it for the long haul. The question with this that we must ask ourselves when we look at the people who need help is, what is the best vision for what God wants to create in this person? In other words, what vision does God have in this person's life that he wants to create out of this situation, out of this scenario? It's looking at people a completely different way. It's looking at them not for their pity or for, um, you know, not just their helplessness, but instead saying, like, what is it that God actually wants to do in the big picture? What does reconciliation to creation, reconciliation to people look like, reconciliation to God look like for this person? Keeping the big picture in mind. The third question and final one is, what's really motivating me? Whew, that's the tricky one, isn't it? When we're really honest, what is it? When we really look in our heart, what is that thing? Why are we actually choosing to help in this situation? A lot of times, if we're honest, sometimes our helping, maybe of a loved one who's caught in a cycle of bad behavior, maybe it's coming from a place of guilt. Maybe we feel partially responsible for their behavior, and so we enter into this cycle of enabling because we feel guilty about it. Maybe it's fear of worrying what would happen. Maybe the motivation is pressure. Maybe from an outside source. You need to be helping people. You need to be doing more. Or maybe even an inside source. Maybe it's a negative pressure. For maybe some um, helping the poor and, and helping the homeless. And maybe some of us is actually, if we're really honest, is coming from some sort of God complex where we think that we need to go into everyone's lives and we understand completely what they need and we just need to put whatever we have and give it to them, right? Because we're so awesome, we've got it figured out. Maybe we, we only look at the material instead of looking to what the person really needs, like hope, dignity, respect. Sometimes it's easier to throw a coin at someone than it is to look them in the eye, say, how you doing? God loves you. I love you. What's motivating us? Our motivation, when it comes to helping, no matter what it is, has to be love. It's got to be love. Because every other motivation will fall short. Every other motivation will fizzle out. It has to come from a source of love. 1 John 3.17 says, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? In other words, it's about the heart. If we're choosing to close our heart off to people and help with a pseudo kind of help that's not really helping, 
how can God's love be in that situation? How can God's love abide in him? Instead, our hearts shouldn't be closed off to people. Our hearts should be open to people. And it should be full of love and compassion. You see, we help because Christ first helped us, right? Amen. Man, did he ever. We love because Christ first loved us. No other reason than that. This has to come from motivation of love for people. Can our helping hurt? Yes. And yet God tells us to help like crazy. But he tells us to help in a biblical way, in an effective way, with the big picture in mind. He tells us to help in a way that will change lives and see real fruit matter. He tells us to go in it for the long haul. And he tells us, tells us to check our motivation every single time. God is calling every single one of us to see the people around us who are hurting and need help. And he's saying, I want you to see the vision that I have for this person and what their life could become. And I want you to help them see that vision for who they could become. God wants you to see his vision for people and have that be your motivation. God wants you to, to do it effectively and he wants you to effectively partner in reaching that goal, reaching that vision. Not just throwing a hand out, not just uh, you know, putting a band-aid and not just a temporary fix. God wants you to partner in his process of allowing and helping people to aspire to that vision that he has for every single person. What is that vision? We know that God sees people as his children. God sees people as beloved. He sees all of you the same way as well. May we be a church that thinks critically about our helping. And after we do, may we help even more. And may we help people aspire to God's vision for their lives and see people through that lens.